Okay, so the power rule, right? So think about what we were talking about last time. How do we, how do we come up with our antiderivative rules? Well, we're just taking the derivatives that we already know, and we're just playing calculus jeopardy with those, right? So we know the power rule, the derivative of x to the k. We know what that is, right? That's just we take the exponent down front and subtract one from the exponent. So we get k times or k times x to the k minus one, right? So if we flip that around and play calculus jeopardy, now the, the question becomes the answer and vice versa, right? So what used to be the answer to our derivative is what we're trying to undo, right? So the antiderivative then of the green part would be the yellow part, right? Plus C. We're asking the question, what could I take the derivative of to give me that? Well, it's x to the k plus c, right? So there's our answer, but that's not a very convenient way to write the rule, right? I mean, if you're thinking about the way that we apply the power rule when we differentiate, you know, we don't want to incorporate some weird constant out front. We want to just be able to say, if I've got x to some power, how do I differentiate that, right? Like, for example, if I were differentiating something like, say we had y equals pi times x to the fifth plus two, and I want to take the derivative of that. Well, I don't want to worry about that pi. I'm just going to leave the pi out front and differentiate the x to the fifth part and then multiply the result times pi, right? I want to be able to focus on the power of x. That's what I want to be able to differentiate, right? Well, I want to be able to do the same thing with an antiderivative. If I'm anti-differentiating or integrating, we'd say. So I don't really want that k to be there, okay? Uh, what, what could I do? What could I do to get rid of that k? I mean, I've got an equation, right? So I should be able to maybe factor that. So one thing I can do, yeah, and let's talk, spend a second and just talk about this. So if I have a k inside an antiderivative, I can pull it out front just like I could with derivatives. And it makes sense because they're like two sides of the same coin, right? We, we can, you know, we can ignore the constant and do the antiderivative and then get an answer and then multiply by that constant just like we could with derivatives. If I were differentiating this, I would forget about the pi, do the derivative and then multiply by pi, right? Okay. So we, the language we'd use if we're talking about calculus, we'd say, okay, let's just pull the derivative or pull the constant out front and just leave it alone out front. So we can still do that. And then I could divide both sides through if I wanted to by k, right? Because I've just, I'm just, I've got this k times my antiderivative. If I divide each side of the equation by k, I'll cancel that and I just get a k on the other side. Okay. Well, that, that works okay, but this is still a little bit inconvenient because look at our look at our rule here. The antiderivative of x to the k minus one. Well, if I wanted to take the antiderivative of something like, let's say, the antiderivative of x to the sixth, I don't want to have to think in terms of, okay, so what would k be? k minus one is six, so k, you know, that's awkward, right? We don't want to do that. We want to be able to just, we want our, our rule to be, to show up as x to some value, not some value minus one. So what could we do? Well, I guess I kind of gave it away there. But this is, this is a time in math where we would make what's called a variable substitution, right? We don't want to have a k minus 1. We'd like to replace that with just a single number, single value. So let's go ahead and make that substitution. Let's let k minus 1 equal n. Does it seem weird to say, let's just let this happen? Not really, though, because, I mean, we, these are just constants. These are just numbers. We're just defining a new number that's more useful to us. We're going to let n equal k minus 1, and that makes the left side of our integral look a lot better. Right now we end up with, if we make that substitution, we get the antiderivative of x to the n dx. That's good. That's really concise and that we can just figure out now exactly for this problem. Well, n is 6. So whatever the, whatever the rule is going to tell me on the other side of the equal sign is what I'm going to do to that 6, right? What happens to the, the right side of the equation if we make that substitution? 
if k minus 1 equals n, then that means if I solve for k, k equals n plus 1, right? So over here, I could replace that k with an n plus 1 and that k with an n plus 1. And there's our power rule for antiderivatives. Okay? It's easy to follow. So what's that give us then up here if we want to do this example? I'm going to get the quotient. What's going to be on top? The antiderivative of x to the n is x to the n plus 1. So what's the exponent going to be on the top? 7. Yeah, I just get x to the 7 divided by 7 plus c, right? Now, doesn't that make sense? If you think about it, if I'm going to differentiate, well, yeah, that makes sense because when I take the derivative of x to the 7th, I'm going to pull the 7 out front, cancels with that 7, and I just get x to the 6th, so it works. Okay? Give me thumbs on that. Everybody, everybody get that? And you don't, you don't really have to do that process ever again. Now you're just going to use, this is just the rule you use when you, when you take an antiderivative of a power. Okay? So let's, well, and this is what I just gave you, right? Let me skip through that. So let's, let's try an example then. Okay, now while we're at it, I'm going I'm to tack on one other little property here. And these are just common sense properties. This is exactly what your intuition would have told you to do anyway. If I'm taking the antiderivative of this polynomial, right? And think about what this, you know, if we're, if we're trying to interpret this, because it's been a couple days since we've talked, actually been a weekend, right, since we talked about this stuff. Remember that the anatomy of our indefinite integral just looks like this, right? We've got our integral sign, and then here's the part that we're trying to undo. It sits between the integral sign and the dx in this case, whatever the variable is we're working with. It's d of that. So here's, here's where our focus is. That's what I'm trying to play calculus jeopardy with, right? Okay, and then I'll get the answer. I take the derivative of what function to get that one back, right? Okay, so then this is the part that we're trying to play calculus jeopardy with. We want to know the derivative of what equals that. Now, but we don't have to just use, we have to think so hard anymore because now we've got some rules we can follow that we can just blindly apply once we identify which ones we need. These are just powers, right? But what about the fact that, that I've got a bunch of terms added up here? I've got three terms added up. What do you think we do? Well, what, what would we have done with derivatives? Individually, we would have just differentiated term by term, right? Well, so we just integrate term by term. Same thing. We just break it into separate, three separate integrals. Remember, integral and antiderivative are, are just interchangeable, right? and we do each of those separately, okay? Make sense? Do you have to write it out that way? No, not really. You can, just, you can just know that that's how you're doing it and just take each of these separately on paper. You don't have to actually write out these three separate integrals. That's just a waste of paper, right? So now we have to apply our power rule, okay? So what is, so don't, don't look at the answer. See if you can just come up with this on your own. Try this, try this real quick on your own here. How, what, what are the steps gonna be? Well, if I'm differentiating this first term, x to the seventh, that's pretty straightforward. The derivative, or sorry, the antiderivative of x to the seventh is what? x to the eighth divided by eight plus c, right? Each one of these is giving me an individual little constant. We could really say, for example, that this is the answer to this one is going to be x to the eighth over eight plus c one. What about the next one? the antiderivative of negative 3x cubed. Well, notice what we did here. We pulled the negative 3 out front of the integral, right? And we're only going to deal with the x cubed part. So what's the antiderivative of x cubed? x to the fourth over 4, right? Right over 4 times negative 3 is just going to give us that answer plus some other little constant, right? Uh, what about this last one, plus 2? Well, the antiderivative of 2 is what? 
two, two X, right? I mean, and if I pull the two out front, really I'm just, I've got the antiderivative of dx, the derivative of what is dx? Well, just x. Okay, so that's giving me my 2x plus some other little constant. But why would I have three little constants when they're just constants? Why not just lump them all together into one big constant, right? We don't know the value of it anyway, right? So you see the little tricks there? I mean, we're just going to deal with these individually. We'll pull the constants out front and being as we're doing multiple antiderivatives at the same time, we just lump all the constants together into one big constant of integration. Okay? Give me thumbs. Okay? Okay, I know this is kind of new stuff. All right. How could we do something like that? Now this is this goes back. This is very similar, and you might remember way back when when we started doing derivatives. One of the things we always wanted to do is we wanted to rewrite the function in a way that was derivative friendly, so we could see what rule to use. Right. Well, here we don't have any we don't have any antiderivative rules that specifically reference square roots. So what would we do here? Just like we would do with with derivatives, if we're taking antiderivatives, same concept. Yeah, those are just one half powers, aren't they? Right. So I would just want to rewrite this thing. At least in my head, I'm rewriting this as the antiderivative of oh, that's kind of a bad point. Antiderivative of square root of x, I would just write as x to the one half. Plus, I've got this. Now, what about this? I've got this 1 over 2 times the square root of x. What's that going to look like? What's my second integral going to look like? The 1 over the square root of x really is x to what power? Negative 1 half. Negative because it's on the bottom. And that 1 over 2, that's really just a constant, isn't it? It's, being, it's the same thing as saying 1 half times x to the minus one half, isn't it? Right, so we'll just put the, the one over two out front, and then I've got an x to the minus one half dx, right? Okay, did I have to write them separately? I didn't really have to. Maybe at first it's not a bad idea when you're just doing your first few examples until you get the swing of, get in the swing of things, you get the hang of it. So what's this gonna give us? If we follow our rule then, what is this one gonna give us? Our power rule. And remember our power rule. Right? Here's our power rule right here. The antiderivative of u to the n du is u to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c, right? So you're just you're you're adding one to the exponent and you're dividing that exponent, dividing by that exponent. So what's that going to give us? n is one half, right? So x to what power then? Three halves. One half plus one, right? So we're getting x to the three halves divided by three halves. Okay, but really, do we want to divide by three halves? What would we rather do? Say it again. Yeah, just multiply by the reciprocal, right? We don't really divide by fractions. We do multiply by the reciprocal. So that first term is just going to look like two-thirds x to the three-halves, right? Plus some constant, but we'll hold off on the constant. We'll just lump them all together. So what about this guy here then? What's this going to give us? We've got this one-half out front already. What are we going to get from that? When we, when we do, when we apply our power rule to that antiderivative, n is one half for that one. So Isaac, what's what's the new exponent going to be? One half plus or uh, n plus one would be what? One half. Okay, so we get plus one half times x to the one half divided by one half. But we'll just instead do what? Multiply by two. Right now, I wouldn't even you wouldn't even really probably write it that way, so we end up then with plus one half times two x to the 
so the one half and the one half and the two cancel, right? And then we can't forget plus C. So our final answer just looks like 2 thirds x to the 3 halves plus x to the 1 half plus c. OK, give me thumbs. How are we doing? OK. OK, so find the general solution to this differential equation. Well, this is different language, but again, a general solution, if we go back to this page, a general solution is just this, this whole answer over here is what we call the general solution to a differential equation, right? The differential equation, we don't always phrase it in the form of a differential equation. Differential equation just means an equation involving one or more derivatives. So saying something like, like this isn't really a differential equation. We're just trying to take an integral, right? But when we see something written in this form, yeah, there's a differential equation because I have a derivative inside an equation. But the, the process of solving that really just involves undoing the derivative, right? Anybody see that? So if I want to solve this thing, I want to know what is y equal to such that its derivative is 2x minus 1. So the first step here is I've got, to, I've got to interpret that question and write it as an integral that I can solve. Okay. So what am I trying to solve to answer this question? What am I trying to do here? What am I trying to anti-differentiate? Yeah, anybody see that? That's what I'm trying to find is the derivative of what equals that, right? And that's what we're just going to call y, right? Everybody see that? Okay, there's like an algebra step you can use to kind of get there too. This is, how do we get from there to there? Well, there really is an intermediate step. I could say, okay, well, what if I do that, right? If I'm, it's conceptually speaking, how do I undo a derivative? I integrate it. I do an antiderivative, right? So the antiderivative of dy dx is just y. On the other side, I've got this antiderivative of 2x minus 1, but you do have to include that dx there too, right? Technically, let me just show that in a little more detail. So, look what happens when I add the dx, right? What's the antiderivative of dy? Well, they literally cancel each other. Right, that's exactly the same way that like a x squared is canceled by the square root of x, right? I mean, so these two are inverse processes, and so the antiderivative of dy is y. Okay, anybody see that? Okay, all right, and so then all we'd have to do is just solve that differential equation. I mean, solve that integral. Okay, and we could, that's not a big deal. Maybe we'll come back to that if we have time. I want to look at a couple other examples. So what about this one? So real quick, give me thumbs on that because there's some concepts there wrapped up in that. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, how about this one? How could I proceed on a problem like that one? Say it again. Okay, so is there like chain rule? And, and there is, but we're not going to have time to learn it. That's called a, a integration by substitution. Usually people call it a U substitution. And I could do something like that, but we just haven't gotten there yet. So there is something coming. 
uh, where we could say, okay, well, what if we let u equal what's inside there? Could we write this in the form? Could we use kind of like a reverse chain rule? And you can, but we just can't do it yet. So being as we don't know the, the kind of the, you know, the reverse chain rule, the, the integral equivalent of chain rule, you know, u substitutions, we still could do this, but we'd have to maybe do a little algebra in order to set it up to be doable. You see the problem here now is that I've got, I've got a 3x plus 5 that's contained inside of my x squared function. We know how to, you know, we know how to anti-differentiate x squared, but we don't know how to anti-differentiate tan squared. We just didn't quite get there. So what could I do, though? Expand it out. Sure. Anybody see that? We could just expand that out, and then we're going to end up with a problem very much like that one, right? Real similar. We're just going to get a trinomial, and then we'll just integrate term by term, okay? So in this case, we would just, we'd end up with what? If I expand that out, I'm going to have the integral of, you guys tell me, if I foil that out, what am I going to get? 9x squared plus 30 x plus 25, right? So I could just split that up then into just do it term by term. So I'm going to get my first one. Now let's go ahead and write these three integrals separately and let's be real specific. How do I want to write this first one then? What do I want to do with the nine? Pull it out front. So the nine comes out front. And then I've just got the integral of x squared dx. Okay, that fits, right? That's just power rule. Middle one. Thirty outside, and then the integral of x dx. And the last one, I mean, when you're doing a constant, I would just write it like this because I know the answer is going to be 25x, right? You could put the 25 out front if you want to, but if you look on our sheet, I think on the standard integral sheet, look at number, well, I guess I didn't even include it. Yeah, I didn't even include it. But a lot of times there'll be an integral that'll look like this. You'll have a standard form that'll look like the integral of k dx equals kx plus c, right? And if you want to add that one on there, I mean, that's it's not a big deal, but. That's maybe another one worth just adding. And then we can just do each of those separately, right? Okay. What would the answer, let's go ahead and finish it. What would the answers be if I take all these integrals then? So I'm going to get, what's the antiderivative of x squared? x cubed over 3 times 9 would give me what? So I could do a little cancellation, right? And that first term is just going to give me 3x cubed. And you can probably, after you've done this a little bit, you can probably just jump right down to the answer for that term. What am I going to get here? Middle one. Antiderivative of x to the 1 is x squared over 2. So 30 over 2 is 15. And then we already said that's 25x, right? Is that my answer? What am I forgetting? Plus C, excellent. Plus C. Okay. Thumbs? Okay. How about that one? That looks like it's going to be some kind of reverse quotient rule. The reverse quotient rule we would not have gotten to this year. The reverse quotient rule, that's called integration by parts, and that's kind of a second year or second semester calculus thing. That's like a BC topic. We might have gotten to it, actually. I think we would have. If we'd had a regular year of this group, we would have gotten to it. I'm sure we would have. I'm going to re re restate that. Okay, what could I do, though? Yeah, we'll just simplify. We'll just, we got a common denominator. Let's just split the common denominator and simplify those quotients, right? We could just write this as, oh, 
that's good. Oh, of course. Okay, so yeah, we could just write this as integral, and we'll just, I'll tell you what, let's just lump it all into one here for this one. So I've got the integral of 4x cubed minus 9x squared dx. So let's see if we can just get those answers now without breaking it up separately. We know we'd pull the 4 out front. Uh, what's the antiderivative of x cubed? x to the 4th over 4 times 4 cancels the 4 on the bottom, doesn't it? So this first one's just going to give us x to the 4th. And you can check it. Just do a quick derivative. What's the derivative of x to the 4th? Well, 4x cubed. It works, right? How about this one? Three x cubed. I'm gonna get x cubed over three. Nine over three is three. Plus c, and we can just check it. If I take the derivative, yeah, sure enough, I get nine x squared. So we know it worked, right? Okay. Okay, we already dealt with one like that. I'll skip that one. We would just pull the one fifth out front and make that y to what power? Oh, actually, hang on. Huh, let's do this one. Let's do this one. So I could pull the one fifth out front. Right? Can I use the power rule there? It's not going to work, is it? That's not going to work, right? If I try to use the power rule, that's the same thing as y to the negative 1. So I'd get y to the 0 divided by 0 from the power rule. Well, that's clearly not going to work, right? But this is a different standard form. The derivative of what is... 1 over y. If you have to cheat and look at your sheet, what's it going to be? What do we take? The derivative of what is equal to 1 over that? What is it? Natural log. Yeah, right. And remember, we like if before, like if we go back in time a little bit, we haven't done one of these in a while. But if I had something like y equals natural log, well, natural log x, then y prime is just 1 over x, right? Okay. So this is just going to give us natural log y, isn't it? Okay, so we end up with one-fifth times natural log y plus c, and that's our answer. Okay? Just different standard form, different rule. Okay, we won't have to do this whole thing, but how would we set that one up? So, yeah, so how do we write that as a single exponent? Out of the five ninths, right? 
because it is r to the fifth to the one ninth, but if we take a power to a power, we multiply the exponents. And so we would just always know to write that as the integral of r to the five ninths dr. And then we just follow the rule, right? n is five ninths, okay? All right, so here's, when are we out of here? One minute. Okay, that's pretty good timing because this, this is the last topic I want to talk about. So just you can see what's going on with this one. Now we're saying let's find the solution to this differential equation. So we're going to anti-differentiate that, that function over there, right? But we want to find the specific answer that goes through that point, okay? So this is called solving a a differential equation with a particular condition, or sometimes we'd say with an initial condition. So that's the topic for next time.